Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Hello, my name is Dick Amster. I'm the Director of Campus Construction here at MIT. I'd like to thank MIT Video Productions, uh, the Infrastructure Communications Team, and Alumni Association for inviting me here today. Uh, we welcome the opportunity to give you a virtual tour of the campus. Uh, we normally start with an idealized view of what the campus could have been from 100 years ago. And then we have this really nice rendering of some of the design principles for MIT. I particularly like an abundance of light, fresh air, plenty of janitorial space, the new materials of steel and concrete. This 100-year-old design uh, foreshadowed modern design uh, aesthetics of today. And this, these buildings are uh, wonderful to work in. Uh, they are robust and they are flexible. MIT grows about a million square feet a decade. And so we'll click through the progression over a 20-year span, and you can see how the campus has grown. We maintain that trajectory today. There is no decade where we see a million square feet of growth, but the average since we came to Cambridge in 1916 is that million square feet. So the campus today looks like this. Uh, and we will show you some of the recent transformations and, and we'll talk about what's, what's coming in the near future. Uh, we're going to start at 77 Mass Ave, a place that I'm sure you're all familiar with or most of you are familiar with. We'll wander around the main group a little bit, head over to Memorial Drive, down to the west end of campus, uh, back up Vassar Street, uh, turn right on Main Street and head to uh, the T-stop in Kendall Square. So I think this is a picture that you're all familiar with. And what you may not be familiar with is what the inside of the uh, Building 7 lobby looks like right now. You'll see here that we have installed entry control. Uh, we call them turnstiles, but they're uh, similar to what you see in office buildings with the doors that open and close. And this is because of COVID. We have done a very good job of trying to control ac of controlling access to our campus this past year. Uh, we put these in in a way that they can be removed without damaging any of the surrounding finishes. And hopefully uh, we're coming out of the pandemic and eventually we can get back to some uh, situation that's normal for access. If we wander outside from Lobby 7, one of the first things we'll see is the Wright Brothers Wind Tunnel, I believe, was commissioned in uh, 1938. Uh, here everybody's walking around looking at it. And in uh, a few months, we will have rebuilt it, installed a new wind tunnel, connected it to 33, and I believe it's 37. Uh, building 17 there on the right uh, will be fully uh, modernized, and the controls for the wind tunnel will be there. We'll be able to test up to 200 miles per hour of wind, uh, and this will be the most robust uh, academic uh, research wind tunnel in the nation. And here you see the old uh, fan on the left with the wooden blades. And that new fan is being commissioned right now. And uh, this is very exciting for us. And it's part of the renewal of buildings that we've been undertaking for the last 14 years since I arrived at MIT. If you step outside the wind tunnel, I'm sure many of you remember this path. I, called, I call what it used to be an alley. It had parking on both sides, curbs, driveway. Uh, and it was really a service lane for all the surrounding buildings. When we built MIT Nano on the site of Building 12, it gave us the opportunity to uh, modernize this into a destination and a landscape path and a path of travel from Mass Ave under 9 all the way to 26. This is very exciting. Uh, the plantings are beautiful. It is a place, uh, a destination. And uh, more to the point, what you don't see is what's as important. We've installed many stormwater uh, implementations to manage and control stormwater. And this is a, a philosophy we have across campus, that what's under the ground is as important as the finished product above grade. And we try to work on how to recapture and reuse and uh, retain stormwater uh, and to keep it out of our basements, quite honestly. Uh, so that's it for the North Corridor. 
I mentioned that the corridor uh, improvements were part of MIT Nano. And here's a graphic that shows the location of the new Building 12 at the intersection of many of the departments of the research that will go in, in place in this facility. It is one of the most efficient buildings of its type that we're aware of in the country, if not the world. There will be about 2,000 researchers who participate in the work inside this building. And it will be at the cutting edge of, this, uh, of nano research. As I'm sure you all know, a nanoparticle is a billionth of a meter. As part of the nano project, we relocated the chemistry undergraduate teaching lab from the fourth floor of building four into the top floor of building 12 nano. And that gave us the opportunity to renovate the space in, from the old UGTL into four research labs for EAPS, Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. I believe that these researchers will be doing environmental research. And as you can see, the top left uh, pictures were the old. Uh, I was up there this morning on my way in for this. And the space is just fabulous. And the researchers have been there and they like the, love the space. So we're very happy for the opportunity to be able to redo a floor in one of the main group buildings. Uh, we are uh, excited about the prospect of an addition at the base of Building 54. We call it Building 55. It will be the headquarters for EAPS, the Environmental Solutions Initiative, and Woods Hole. It will be a fabulous shining uh, spot at the base of the building, and there will be beautiful landscape around it. And it also gives us the opportunity to improve 54100, the lecture hall in Building 54. And, and provide a, a new entry sequence to that lecture hall. We're also in the middle of an infrastructure improvement project in Building 54. We're targeting LEED Platinum, and uh, I'm sure I'll mention some more sustainability along the way. And the expectation is that, that this project will complete in 2023. Uh, continuing in the vicinity, uh, we move across uh, McDermott Court into Building 14 where we've been working in Hayden Library. So here's the reading room in Hayden Library a few years ago. Here is the graphic of what we intended to do. And here is the completed project that will be opening sometime in the near future. I also visited there today. It is just spectacular. It's, uh, the Library of the Future is a big topic across uh, the academy and across academia. And this has improved uh, team spaces, quiet spaces. There'll be a cafe. And as you'll see coming up, we've also moved out into the courtyard uh, based upon a gift from a great friend of MIT. And this will be a destination spot for uh, people to mingle, to sit outside, and uh, to enjoy uh, a quiet space on campus. Moving down Memorial Drive, we are just completing a renewal of the boathouse. This is the one with oars and not sails. The interior is new with workout rooms and locker rooms, boat storage, improved boat storage. Access into the building has been improved from the ramp from the sidewalk on Memorial Drive. We have improved the support systems for a building on the water as well as the floating docks. So we were very happy to make this, uh, this investment for DAPER and uh, this, w this is a, 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 a situation of equity too, where we've uh, made locker rooms that are of, of equal uh, support for all gender. And uh, we're thrilled with the way the boathouse has turned out. Continuing down Memorial Drive, in the past 14 years, we've renovated W1 and W70, and now we're at Burton Connor. We will upgrade the student rooms. We will upgrade the public spaces and install all new infrastructure. Our project architect lived in Burton Connor. This project will be turned over next summer. This is the music building, the proposed music building. This will be built on the Kresge parking lot. In about a month, the fence will go up and we will start moving dirt around. There'll be a 120 space below grade parking structure. And you can see two of the three uh, elements of this building this will be performance spaces, rehearsal spaces, uh, recording spaces, teaching spaces. This is another architectural jewel on campus. And uh, the expectation is that, that this building will turn over in 2023. If we go all the way down Vassar Street on West Campus, 
uh, on the site of the parking lot, ne- parking lot next to Simmons Hall, a new two structure graduate residence will start to take shape. This will be apartment style living on campus, 690 units. This is very, very exciting for a, a different type of living uh, arrangements for graduate students. Continuing up Vassar Street, this is the new undergraduate residence that we've just completed and occupied in this year. This is 450 undergraduate uh, units in what is, has been a very exciting project to design and build. There are amenity spaces, lounges, workrooms, uh, music room, There's a head of house apartment, an associate head of house apartment, 12 graduate resident tutors, an area director. This is the next uh, new jewel in our undergraduate residence system. There's a dining hall uh, where anybody on campus can go to eat. There is a cook for yourself kitchen. And I'm gonna pause for a moment and talk about art. MIT has one of the most important public art collections period, in the world. Not just universities, but public art collections. We're closing in on 70 pieces situated across the campus. And we were lucky enough to be able to install three on this campus, all from different sources. So on the top left, you see an untitled piece by Robert Engram. We all call it the Mobius. And while it looks very robust, it's a fragile piece. It's made of aluminum. uh, And when it's taken down from its hanging, It sort of uh, collapses and compresses, and yet to move it around, we normally have to take a window out of a building. We are excited that this permanent donated piece from the 60s has now found a new home. On the right is a piece by Matt Johnson. He was doodling around and came up with a structure like this. He went to, he took a piece, a railroad tie from the High Line in New York, bent it. It's untitled, but we call it the Swan. It was exhibited there at the High Line, uh, and then through the gift from a great friend of MIT, it came here. And what we're excited about is it's about 50 to 100 feet from our railroad. So this is a do- another donated piece, but of recent vintage. And finally, the piece on the left is a painting with beadwork by an artist named Jeffrey Gibson. And it's hard to see in the picture, but the title is, I Don't Want to See Myself Without You. And you can see that sort of wrapping around the center of the piece. It's an incredibly vibrant and beautiful painting, but uh, of equal importance to us. It's the first piece in the collection by a Native American. And this collection is very focused on uh, diverse diverse artists. And so we're happy to have added this to our collection. And, you know, the thing we think about with art is that everybody goes about their business on campus uh, to and from class, to and from research, to and from living and learning. But we think that the art adds to the experience of our community as they do that traveling around campus. I'm sure everybody remembers the Met Warehouse. We are in the development process and the design process of transforming the Met Warehouse into the future home for the School of Architecture and Planning and Project Manus. We've got a long way to go to get the design done. This is a huge, tough, challenging building. It was never meant for occupancy other than for people's storage materials. And uh, we are working hard on this. The goal is to turn this building over in 2025. Okay, moving up Vassar Street toward Main Street. This will be the future home for the MIT Stephen A. Schwartzman College of Computing. As you can see, the earthwork has started. We're stabilizing the perimeter of the site and digging will begin probably in the next few weeks. The goal here is to uh, create a new college on campus. So, you know, we have our five schools. This will add a college. It will be cross-disciplinary. And the development of this building is extremely, extremely exciting. The building will turn over in 2023 and we have every expectation and we are targeting LEED Platinum for the building. But we go beyond LEED and we will make this as sustainable a a space and as efficient a space as possible. There are green roofs here, there are green roofs on the Vassar dorm. uh, And so uh, we're gonna use medium temperature water to heat it, not steam. And so this is a a very exciting project for us from that perspective. Before we turn the corner 
and move up to the Kendall T. I just wanted to pause for a minute and talk about this intersection of Vassar Street and Main Street. We call this the densest square mile on the planet of research and entrepreneurship and innovation. And here's what it looked like in 1990 with our neighbors. And here's what it looks like today. Everybody wants to be across the street from MIT to get our ideas, help us do research, help us implement, get their new employees. This is a very exciting time for us. And as we move up the street to what we call south of Main Street, uh, on your right, you'll see a tower that we call Site 5. On your left, you'll see a tower that we call Site 4. Uh, that white swoopy thing, the wing thing, is our, over the uh, Kendall Square T-stop. The two towers and the office buildings in front of them are completed and occupied. Here is the view uh, at the entry to the MIT Museum. It will occupy the first three floors of that commercial tower, Site 5. The shell, the core shell is done. It is beautiful. It will be a great backdrop for the installation of the first exhibition of the museum, which uh, the MIT Museum staff is working on now. And sometime next year, we expect that to open and it will be it's a spectacular backdrop uh, for the MIT Museum. Uh, the open space is almost finished. There's an outdoor theater, there's a play area. Um, this was a parking lot. Okay, I can't emphasize that enough. This was the medical parking lot we, that we've turned into three towers, one a graduate residential tower and uh, a commercial lab, build, lab tower and a commercial office tower, and then this open space with a 1,200 space garage beneath it. We are fully focused on every project to include sustainability, resilience, and efficiency in everything we do. And that includes the quality of life for the future occupants and users of these buildings. And so we put up messaging. Uh, these signs have gone up and we're, we're working on them for some of the other projects I've already mentioned that just describe for the people that are in the building what we've implemented uh, for each of the aspects of the building. In addition, the occupants include uh, MITOS, the Office of Sustainability, uh, the uh, Environmental Solutions team is in there, Admissions is in there, uh, the Innovation uh, Infrastructure team is in there, uh, Jesse Slosher Smith, the Open Space Coordinator is in there as well. So uh, we're very happy with the way these buildings have been renewed. Christos will be giving a tour of Site 4. Good afternoon. My name is Christos Maravellas, and I'm a senior project manager with MIT's Campus Construction Group. Uh, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to give you a tour of Site 4 today. Uh, we'll start our tour from the Welcome Center located in building E38. So we're going to start the tour from the lobby uh, in building E38. This is the new MIT's Welcome Center. The inviting lobby, the depiction of MIT's dome on the wall, the story wall, and the welcome desk will be the new phase to MIT's 40,000 uh, plus uh, admissions visitors annually. The 200 seat flexible event space will serve multiple purposes. Will support uh, the MIT admissions department, but also will offer a, a venue for the community, not only the MIT community, but the Cambridge community to gather and utilize. The Entrance to the MIT's Welcome Center was strategically located uh, adjacent to the inbound MBTA Red Line station that draws thousands of commuters daily, but also right across from the new MIT Museum. So there is that connection between the admission space, the innovation hub, and the MIT. The building is situated uh, in a way that opens to the open space. The doors and windows on the south side of the event space are flexible. So during the summer, spring, summer, fall months, 
they can collapse and create that inner out connectivity between the building, the forum, and the open space. So the, the next stop in our tour will be the second floor in building E38 that houses MIT's admissions office. Uh, the modernized admissions office occupies the second floor in building E38. It's approximately 20,000 square feet. And uh, as uh, uh, Dean Schmel said, moving the admissions office from Mass Ave to Kendall not only strengthens MIT's visibility, but also highlights the critical connection between the Institute and the innovative high-tech enterprises who flourish in this area. We did work in a very close collaboration with the City of Cambridge Historical Commission to be able to maintain the character of, uh, of this historic building that was built in 1920s. Uh, we went back and forth with the Commission in the selection of colors for the building, in the design of the windows, and we believe that we truly managed to somehow bring that old character to life. Our next stop in our tour will be the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Hub. It is located on the top five floors in building E38. The hub is sort of an anchor of a campus-wide ecosystem that moves ideas from the Institute to the marketplace. On this floor, we have the main entrance to MIT's Innovation and Entrepreneurship uh, Hub, but also we have the connector to three sustainability groups that co-locate within building E38. We have MIT's ESI, the MITOS, and the JWOFS groups. And it was sort of the, the intent behind moving those groups within this ecosystem was strategic because we believe that there is an opportunity to integrate their thoughts, their ideas within the innovation ecosystem and promote those ideas to make the world a better place. Welcome to MIT's Innovation Hub. It is located again in building E38 on the top five floors of the, of the building and uh, will provide uh, uh, space for various initiatives within, uh, within the MIT ecosystem. Uh, the MIT Innovation Initiative will be the largest group that will be housed within this facility, but other groups include, but not limited, to VMS, uh, Despande, uh, Sandbox, and, and, other, and other groups. Uh, the intent, the design of the facility, was mainly uh, geared towards, let's make it flexible, Let's make it uh, vibrant. Let's give some color. Let's allow for the innovators to gather, right? The students, the faculty, the researchers, uh, individuals from the industry get together and, uh, and solve uh, problems, come up with ideas, create the new startups that we have seen flourishing within the Cambridge ecosystem and beyond. Uh, one of the design features within the, the hub was to introduce a communicating stair that will connect all those floors of the hub. The intent was, again, you know, allow for those ideas to flow, right? From individual to individual, from group to group, from floor to floor, from department to department, and then out into the industry. So as you can see, uh, it's an it's a interesting design concept uh, that sort of cuts through an existing building and brings life throughout the various floors of the building. We are on uh, the seventh floor in building E38. Again, it's a, it's, a, it's a floor that serves the innovation hub. It's more of a co-location space that will uh, sort of accommodate the multiple groups of the hub, not, specific, dedica not specifically dedicated to one of those groups. And the main intent is to have workshops, uh, have hackathons take place here. One of the nice features on this floor 
is the newly introduced facade facing south towards the open space, but also you can get glimpses of the childcare playground on the roof of the MIT's forum. It's nice to innovate and at the same time have a look at the kids and the new generation of innovators for the years to come. So the buildings, both buildings E38 and E37, were completed in October of 2020. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, we haven't seen that influx of population coming into the facilities, and that's why the space is still empty. This building was built in 1920s. It was an industrial building. It was uh, uh, made out of concrete. Uh, so the, the, you know, the complexities that posed as part of the new uh, uh, redevelopment was mostly associated with the lack of flexibility of the space. Right? Concrete structure, not, not easy to work with. At the same time, it was very forgiving because it did allow the project right, to establish openings on the floors to create those communicating stairs. Not forgiving because the floor to ceiling height was limited. So because we had all the mechanical systems you know, run above ceiling, so we had to somehow incorporate all those systems within a cavity that dropped the ceiling to a lower uh, plane than what uh, uh, we would like it to be. That will conclude the tour of uh, building E38. Our next stop will be building E37 that houses uh, uh, the graduate student population. The next stop in our tour uh, will be a visit to building E37. It's a 29-story uh, tower that uh, houses graduate student population uh, for MIT. It, uh, it has 454 units. It's more than double the number of units uh, from uh, building E55 that will replace when E55 is removed for the further development of the Kendall Square Initiative. So we are on uh, the 22nd floor of the residential tower. Each floor is very typical. So there are approximately 20 units on, uh, on each level. And to create some, um, you know, a differentiation, an identity, if you will, uh, on each floor, we have introduced different colors. So somebody can say we're on the red floor of the tower. So we're going to go and uh, have a look in one of the south-facing units uh, with uh, the most spectacular views. So, so this is uh, a one-bedroom unit. Uh, it is housed, as we said, on the 22nd floor. You had uh, the opportunity to have a look at the, at the fantastic views out of the windows. So it's uh, one bedroom. The, the systems that we, provi we provided, the project provided um, as part of the, the unit, you know, fully furnished uh, kitchens. Uh, of course, every unit comes with a bathroom. Uh, the loose furniture, that those were provided by uh, DSL. Uh, now, unique aspects of this facility is that steps that we took as part of the design is to somehow make it as energy efficient as possible. So uh, for that purpose, the heating and cooling units are passive units. We call them valence, uh, valence units. And they don't have any mechanical components. Uh, you just run hot and chill water through uh, coils, and that's how you condition the space. Right? The flow in the faucets uh, and sour heads are controlled, again, to minimize, provide the, the gallons per minute needed for the users to, to be satisfied, but at the same time, don't consume too much water. Uh, so all the steps that we have taken within this facility is geared towards you know, resiliency, sustainability, functionality. Uh, and I believe, I believe the team has done a fantastic job achieving those goals. So we are on, uh, on the fourth floor terrace in the residential tower, uh, it's a it's a 
sprawling space that definitely will allow the residents uh, to, to enjoy the surroundings during the spring, summer, and fall months. On the south side, you can get some uh, you know, extensive glimpses of the open space. Uh, already tables have been, uh, have been spread out, individuals occupy the space. Right above us is the newest art piece that has been commissioned by MIT as part of the Percent for Art program. It was uh, designed by Agnieszka Current. Uh, it's a pair of pieces. Uh, it's called The End of Signature. And one piece, as you can see, is on the underside of, uh, of the cantilever section inside four. The other will be in, uh, on the underside of the cantilever section in uh, side three. So let's take a walk um, around the corner to have a look at the child care playground from the top. So as you can see through the, through the window, uh, this is a 7,000 square feet uh, playground uh, space that is mainly utilized by our uh, uh, child care center uh, that provides significant services to the MIT community for both uh, toddlers and preschoolers. And uh, the, the beauty of this space is that when the center is not in operation, it can be enjoyed by the residents uh, of, of the tower. So residents, graduate students and their families, after hours, can, they can step out and enjoy the playground as well. We're going to wrap our tour in buildings E38 and E37 in one of the common spaces within the residential tower. The majority of the common spaces are located on the third and fourth floor. Uh, that, that was, that was uh, intended sort of to bring the students and their families together in a centralized location. The common spaces within, uh, within the E37 include, as we said, lounges, study rooms, conference rooms, the centralized laundry area, but also a couple of uh, exercise spaces with, uh, uh, with equipment that can be used by the residents uh, either for a Pilates or uh, to utilize those equipments that they are provided. I would like to close uh, this tour uh, by, by stating that it takes a village you know, to build a project of this size, of this complexity, uh, and uh, this was not different. So uh, we had a fantastic dedicated team of uh, architects, engineers, contractors, subcontractors, vendors, internal uh, 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 folks from all the clients' teams that work together collaboratively to make this happen. Uh, the architect of record for the facility was Parkinson Will, and the design architect was Nader Tehrani, who used to be the head of the Department of School of Architecture uh, here at MIT. Uh, so a huge, uh, a huge uh, thank you to all the team members who made this happen. Uh, thank you to everybody, the project teams. Th these buildings were the efforts of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people and tens of uh, managers. And uh, thank you to everybody for the work that you've done. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks to all the presenters who've taken their time to show you what we've been doing for the last few years. We hope someday you can return to campus soon and see what we've shown you virtually. We're proud of what we do, we're proud of the campus, and thank you again for joining. We now have Dick Amster, Director of Campus Construction, and Joe Higgins, VP of Campus Services and Stewardship here with us to answer your questions from the chat. Gentlemen, welcome. Uh, let's start with a pressing question given our current global situation. Given the changes we've seen in campus life under the pandemic, how might MIT change and adapt for the hybrid workflow we are likely to adopt going forward? So, well, so I can take that one, James. Hi, you. everyone. And, and I do want to extend a, a, a thanks to uh, Dick and all of his team that made all of these amazing projects uh, possible over the, the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, and, and keeping the progress uh, moving. So I, I think we have a, a, a new normal uh, ahead of us. Um, so I, I think right now there's an effort uh, at MIT called Work Succeeding, 
where that is, you know, we're in a, you know, discovery mode of, you know, what are the new ways of working uh, when we return back to campus in the fall. So this is a time, you know, after Labor Day, you know, all of faculty, students, um, and, and staff will, will be returning to campus. And knowing now, you know, the amount of work that we can accomplish remotely, whereas, you know, 18 months ago, we didn't think we'd be able to accomplish everything that we have, uh, you know, being in sort of this remote posture. Um, it is a very interesting thought exercise in terms of what, you know, the new ways of working will be, uh, whether it's uh, remote, hybrid, or on campus. Um, and, and that might uh, raise some interesting opportunities in, in how we think about space utilization uh, going forward. But right now, I think the emphasis is really just figuring out with each individual area kind of figuring out what their own work plans are going to be for the fall, learn from that, um, and then continue to evolve. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, Another question, but maybe returning to life on campus, uh, will our alumni IDs work with the new turnstiles? So, so right now access to campus is, is managed through this wonderful application developed uh, by ISNT called COVID Pass. So uh, right now, you know, the way that we uh, manage, you know, people who access our campus right now is through uh, individual control points uh, and buildings. So this is something new to MIT's history. We used to be a very open campus, as all of you know, all the doors are open to Lobby 7 all the time, 24, 7, 365 days a year. Um, but with uh, the pandemic, um, we had to very quickly put into place um, um, an access control system so that we can have assurances that uh, people, you know, are undergoing regular testing, that people would test every day that they have no symptoms. Uh, it was wildly successful, able to implement that in, in a matter of many months. Kudos to the ISNT team uh, and many others that made uh, that possible. So I think the short answer to the question is, if you are in COVID pass through the application um, on your iPhone, um, and you know, you do regular testing at MIT right now, it's, it's twice a week for people who regularly access the campus. Um, or, you know, there are people in the alumni office that, you know, can get a one-time pass uh, for you to access the campus. And in that case, your IDs would work. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let's see, very, very MIT question here. Will Building 55 interfere with the Great Pumpkin Drop and how might it affect the wind tunnel? So I would say this, uh, there will be opportunity for a pumpkin drop away from uh, the addition. Certainly hope we're not dropping the pumpkins on the new roof. Uh, the wind tunnel issue, uh, I don't think this will increase or exacerbate the wind tunnel issue, but the, the flow of wind from the river up through the opening between 50 uh, Walker and uh, the, the library building uh, is not gonna be affected and I don't think exacerbated by the new building. Uh, Follow-up question, I think, for Building 55 here, if I'm not mistaken. How can a building to the east of the Great Dome have an odd number? Well, I saw that question during the, uh, during the presentation. Uh, we have a, an FIS group, Facilities Information Systems group, that numbers the buildings. And so that it's a pretty uh, simple, though complex, uh, way that we do it. So 40, for instance, uh, the College of Computing was on the site of 44 and it's now 45. So there must be uh, technical ways around how we do the numbering that allows that to happen in odd building to the east. And I think there are two other odd buildings, isn't there? So I think the alumni pool is building 57, that, that's east and, and then the sailing pavilion is 51. That, that's east of the, the Great Dome as well. So as Dick said, it's a very uh, complex rubric on how this happens and every time we want to uh, uh, number a building. Yeah, gentlemen, I think we were discussing it just before this began as well. It's a, one of those things. Um, uh, accessibility question, I think. Any plans for a walkable bridge or tunnel crossing Vassar from the College of Computing? So the city does not uh, look favorable. We studied, a, before I got here, MIT studied a tunnel from the Brain and Cognitive Building, Building 46 across Vassar Street, uh, not a tunnel, a, a bridge. The city is, uh, did not look favorably upon the idea of a bridge. Uh, it's come up a few times since then, and, and we seem to have uh, uh, finessed not uh, pursuing it with the city. The street is full and full and full of utilities. And so a tunnel uh, across would have to be a very deep, and it would be a very challenging uh, construction site. So at this point, 
the, uh, the College of Computing will connect to uh, 46 Brain and Cog. I think it's on the third floor, uh, but no plans to cross Vassar Street. Thanks, Dick. I think this might be somewhat related as well. Uh, is there an interior connection between the Kendall T Station and the MIT pedestrian tunnel network? No, there is not. And by the way, I did also see uh, someone highlighting the uh, importance of accessibility uh, and around uh, as, as important as sustainability, and we agree. Uh, so we go beyond, so uh, accessibility is the, uh, there is a minimum in the law and in the codes that we follow, that we have to follow. And, but we go beyond that. We want this to be universally welcoming for anybody who has challenges, uh, mobility, visual, hearing. Uh, and so we, we always consider and we always study and we always have a, a code review and we put options into our buildings to make sure that we are um, breaking down impediments. And then we know that we've got an aging uh, site. And so we try to uh, address uh, trip hazards and things like that and, and curb cuts to, to enhance the experience of people, uh, all people that come to campus. Thanks, Dick. Hopefully, let, let's see if either of you have the information on this one. What is the state of the network at MIT? Wi-Fi, Ethernet, fiber? So all, all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that, <laughs> Joe. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's one of the original, you know, movers of, you know, sort of technology and, and, and how data flows. I, I know that's something very important now to the MIT's capital plan. I think what we've learned now, you know, after COVID is, you know, the importance of IT infrastructure on the campus. Um, and there's efforts underway to kind of redouble, you know, what that technology investment would look like over, over the next uh, decade. I, I know right now there's several investments going into 5G um, across the campus to make that uh, uh, more robust. So, so it's something definitely when we think about capital plans and buildings, we're also now thinking about, you know, MIT's technology footprint uh, with, with absolutely equal and, and greater weight. Perfect. In the new building, uh, do you have separate wastewater handling for the gray and black water? Very specific. Well, I saw that question and I uh, almost uh, texted Christos to ask the question. I don't know the answer to that uh, okay. off the top of my head. So uh, we'll, we'll figure out the answer to that. Yeah, there's a lot of different water saving technologies. I know that's not the first go to. I mean, we do things around, you know, you know, how we do landscaping around the site so we don't have to constantly irrigate them. There's things about low flow fixtures, uh, water reuse, uh, you know, so, so I know there's a number of different strategies, but, but that, that's a hard technology to implement. And I know it's something we evaluate um, on, on many of our, our building projects. And then I've got a question here about the new child care center. How many children does the new child care center handle? So, so there was a great article, I, I think, published with the opening of the child care uh, center. So it is, it is active. It's about 8,000 square feet. I think it's 58 toddlers um, and, and preschool children is, is, is the capacity. So it, it's an incredible space, as Christos in his tour uh, pointed out. And it's just so amazing to see all of the, you know, the, the people taking advantage of that incredible, incredible space. Oh, and a great note in the chat. I, um, how much, if at all, will the exterior of the Metropolitan Warehouse change? So there's uh, obviously, uh, as you all know, there's four sides to the building. Uh, Cambridge Historic, uh, uh, our, our colleagues in Matimco uh, several years ago uh, did some work uh, on the facade to preserve it uh, repoint it, uh, repaint the words, um, and, and just stabilize the building. The uh, Mass Ave face of the first building, building one of the five buildings, will be preserved. And there will be probably the restoration of some windows up at the highest level that were uh, eliminated years and years ago. I'll say that. I don't know when. There will be some possibly some new windows in the Vassar Street facade 
that because those will be offices and offices we prefer, we think we prefer that offices get natural light. And so we're talking to Cambridge Historic about uh, natural light. The, the face that faces the new uh, Vassar Street dorm and the railroad tracks will have major uh, glass interventions that will be, and have, this has been reviewed by Cambridge Historic as well. It's not finally approved, but we think we have a path to that. So from Mass Ave and Vassar Street, it'll be very similar to what you see today. From the other two faces, there will be glass interventions that will frame double height space. Uh, as we said, it's for architecture and planning. So planning, and so there will be uh, double height spaces for workrooms and so on and so forth. So minimal change on two faces, significant and beautiful changes on those other sides. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here, just looking for a little bit more in-depth description of the passive heating cooling system in the new grad residence tower. So the, the idea is, uh, and uh, I'm an English major, folks, so don't get upset if you hear me start talking uh, about engineering uh, technologies. 40 years in, construct, uh, in construction, but uh, still an English major. Uh, I, I call it displacement technology. And so the, the cool and, and, and warm air flow out of uh, those valence units that Christos has referenced. And so it's, it's not with fans and, and heat pumps and things like that, that's, that's heating and cooling, but more just uh, having the uh, air flow out in, in a managed way, uh, in, in a designed way that uh, does that heating and cooling. Thanks, Dave. A couple more questions have just dropped. Um, this one is interesting. So in terms of planning, how are campus emergency evacuation procedures uh, kept in mind and integrated into the planning process? And how much coordination is done with the Cambridge City authorities? I'll start and then Joe can talk about the big picture if I don't get uh, where we need to get to. Uh, we do many tabletop exercise. We have uh, an emergency team. We have an emergency office. They're coordinated with the MIT police. They're coordinated with the academy. We do many tabletop exercises about what ifs. Uh, and when we do those, the Cambridge authorities are there. So we are closely uh, collaborating with uh, police, fire, uh, Cambridge, uh, uh, Department of Public Works, etc. cetera. So uh, we are ready uh, the team knows we convene the team when we need to, and uh, we, we are working closely and integrated uh, with the city. Yeah, I, I think going back to what Dick said earlier, like every project is literally hundreds and hundreds of people with knowledge and know-how that ask these very same questions, whether it's sustainability or resiliency, emergency management. We have wonderful emergency management planners at MIT, very gifted subject matter experts amazing people with the city of Cambridge. We have some expert consultants. We have a whole internal engineering team that does nothing but think about how all of these systems uh, tie together. So it, it, it really is a village <laughs> when thinking about all of these complex uh, decisions that need to be made in, in, in a very complex urban environment. Thanks, Joe. And then this one, um, I'm curious how MIT thinks about and plans for the kinds of sea level rise challenges that the greater Boston area is likely to see in the years ahead. So, so this is a, a, a great question. So I, I know when we look out, we see the, the Charles River and we think you know, sea level rise you know, out of the harbor is gonna translate into sea level rise in the Charles River. And I think what we found out is we've worked with a number of people throughout the city, a number of engineers uh, with the city of Cambridge, city of Boston, uh, our own internal MIT subject matter experts. Um, really the threat and risk uh, is not sea level rise for MIT, at least not for you know, more than 100 plus, 200 plus years. Uh, really the, the, the more imminent risk for us is storm water. So, so, so you know, flash floods that you know, happen in, in you know, kind of towns around um, you know, Massachusetts, you know, where you just get like four inches of rain in an hour. <laughs> And, and, you know, and the pipes aren't big enough to like get rid of the water. And now you have water in the basements that Dick was talking about earlier. So, so we have a wonderful partnership with the city of Cambridge where we've developed uh, a, a flood map model. Um, I know there was an MIT news article um, published about this probably about three weeks ago, but it really shows all the different scenarios of flood risk 
um, in Cambridge and what the impact is towards the MIT campus. And we can design solutions now based upon where the model would predict that sort of these uh, flash flood events uh, would occur. So there's an incredible amount of work we have to do on the campus um, over the, you know, the next decade, but that's part of our capital planning is to make the campus more resilient to these uh, uh, flash flood risks that are, are clearly you know, happening today. So there was a, a follow-up question, not to be alarmist, but um, is MIT sinking? Infinitesimally. <laughs> Seriously, uh, it's it. We we know we monitor, and uh, we, we don't think this is an immediate issue. Our our foundations, the the forest of wood piles, are strong and preserved uh, for the main group, and. Uh, this is not this is not a real world issue right now. It may be in a hundred years. Just going through, uh, there was one question I passed over from our chat early on. Um, any concerns with the new music building blocking the view of MIT Hinge? So the way we've designed it, the uh, top of the building, uh, the top of the music, the tallest piece of the music building is very similar to the top of Kresge. And so we do not expect that it, it will interfere with the uh, sunlight coming through. Uh, gentlemen, with that, uh, I wanna thank everyone for attending the Capital Projects tour. Please take a look at the agenda to see what other great events we have happening throughout the weekend. Thank you. Thanks for the Thanks great questions, you. everyone. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.